We, we turn next. We, we turn next to uh, Dr. Nancy Bonini, uh, who's going to talk about uh, epigenetics uh, of neurodegenerative disease. Just briefly, uh, Dr. Bonini is a professor of biology at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also in cell and developmental biology and neuroscience. Uh, I, I hardly need to say more about her. She's received numerous uh, uh, awards and commendations for her achievement. We're very uh, fortunate, uh, Nancy, that you're here with us today. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I need to have screen sharing enabled. So I think I need to be made a co-host. Let's see. Got it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I want to thank um, the organizers so much for inviting me to talk at this really exciting meeting and thank the leadership um, for their support. Um, and today I was going to talk about some of the studies that um, we've been doing um, on the epigenetics of neurodegenerative disease, and in particular about histone post-translational modifications in the brain with age and disease. And the way I got into this is actually through fly screens where we found in a TDP43 fly model where if we compare a regular wild type eye to a fly expressing TDP43, the eye is externally disrupted and internally it's very degenerate. And we found a whole series of modifiers that modify TDP43 toxicity. Um, and here's an example of one that causes a rescue on the external eye and a dramatic rescue internally. And this turns out to these genes seem to all impinge down on a specific histone modification called H3K4 trimethyl. Um, and so that suggested to us that upregulating this mark is protective against TDP43 toxicity. And we also had other data um, in terms of studying healthy brain aging, that epigenetics is really important to it, in particular silencing marks. So that led me to reach out and initiate a collaboration with Shelley Berger, who's currently the director of the Penn Epigenetics Institute, to try to attack this question of what's going on epigenetically in the aging brain and in neurodegeneration. And just to underscore the potentially very powerful impacts that epigenetics can have, I'd like to, to show you one of the systems that Shelley works on. She works on a number of different systems. And this is um, ants. So she decided to work on ants because these are, these are two casts in a species of ant. These ants have identical DNA genomes, but these casts have really strikingly different features. So the one on the left is um, smaller, it has a different morphology, its behavior is different, it's an ant worker, and its lifespan is very different. Whereas the ant on the right is a queen, and queens um, are designed to um, lay eggs. They have a really spectacularly long lifespan. Um, and obviously they're very different in size and morphology and aspects of the brain are also different. And what's really striking about the situation is again, these different casts all come from the same genome, but these features can also be reprogrammed and reversed, sort of emphasizing the real power um, of epigenetics um, in these systems. So our question is sort of could impacts of environment and those type of stress risk factors or other risk factors be due in part to alterations that are happening on the chromatin. And by that, I mean, as you know, in the cell is the DNA coupled with all of its histone proteins um, to make nucleosomes. The genome is highly structured into a 3D architecture. Um, there are DNA modifications, there are RNA modifications, and there's also histone modifications that are absolutely critical to control this entire chromatin setup. Um, and there are many different uh, types of mechanisms that can happen. So it's known in model organisms with age that a number of different processes 
can lead to aging, including that happen with age, I should say, histone loss and imbalance of various different histone modifications, methylation changes, changes in chromatin, um, the localization of the nucleosomes, changes in heterochromatin, and also transcriptional and other changes um, that are changes that are known to happen in various different types um, of neurodegenerative disease, as well as ALS and FTD. So um, our question is focused on looking at histone modifications to ask if we can glean anything by this global type of analysis, genomic type of analysis to ask what's going on with histone modifications and what kind of specific theories or hypotheses that will raise um, that we could then attack um, in our various different models. And so by histone modifications, I mean those changes that happen to the N-terminal regions of histone um, molecules called the histone tails. And as you're aware, there's a bewildering array of potential histone modifications that one could approach. And we decided in approaching this question to go after some genes that are most um, associated with um, gene expression and gene activation. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of these marks. Um, H3K27 acetyl and H4K16 acetyl. And we also um, uh, initially went under the assumption that this could be very challenging. It turns out to be challenging. <laughs> um, and these are marks that tend to be sort of narrow marks that would allow us um, to, to understand trends that are happening in these disease situations. So these particular marks, um, Histone in its closed conformation, if you're talking about euchromatin, is in a deacetylated state where the histones are closer together. And acetylation of the histone tails is going to open up chromatin and be associated with gene activation. So all of these marks do that. H4K16 acetyl is generally an open mark. H3K27 and K9 acetyl tend to be associated with enhancers and promoters of activated gene expression. So the, and moreover, we know that histone acetylation is really crucial to a number of processes, including learning and memory, um, as well as aging. So H4K16 acetyl is a mark that's known to be increased with aging in yeast and in higher cells. Um, and there are some data to suggest that changes in histone acetylation might be happening in mouse models and function restored by manipulating those marks back towards normal. And as we know, CBP um, is mutated in human intellectual disability, suggesting that these would be key marks that might be important. So our question um, was, are there chromatin regulatory pathways, so these sort of more global regulatory pathways that can either prevent or promote brain degeneration? And we were particularly keen to include healthful brain aging, sort of a younger set and an older set, to ask about what are the epigenetic genetic dynamics that's happening during healthful brain aging and how does this compare to disease? And so there have been a lot of studies that have done this with respect to comparing, um, well, a number of studies, old age matched versus Alzheimer's disease. And we decided to analyze younger, older, and then the disease state. And in this, we worked with the Center for Neurodegenerative Disease Research here to pick out really high quality um, control and disease tissue that showed both clinical and neuropathological marks associated with the disease, but also that wouldn't have other types of neurology, et cetera. And, um, what I'm going to show you today is unfortunately just what we've done on Alzheimer's disease, but I think you can understand the sort of approaches we're taking. At the same time, we did pull out FTD tissue, both C9 plus and C9 minus, but we need to return to those studies. 
So we took tissue from the middle temporal gyrus and we took um, a study group that had a younger age of around 50 years, an older age and an Alzheimer's cohort. And in addition, we showed these studies in a, a smaller number and then we repeated them in a larger number. So I'd like to emphasize the, the ability of these findings to be repeated in additional um, study groups. So the way you look at um, epigenetic or histone marks is you take the tissue, you isolate the nuclei and cross-link the DNA to the nucleosomes, then you sonicate uh, the DNA so that you break it into small pieces, you use um, an immunoprecipitation to pull down the particular chromatin mark, chromatin with marks that you're interested in, release the DNA, and then sequence that DNA. And as you can see, you then end up getting read pileups that can tell you peak sizes or where that mark is on histones in the chromatin. And many histone, many peak sizes stay absolutely the same, but what you end up doing is focusing on peak changes and the associated genes to try to glean some insight of into what's happening. So our first question um, was based on H4K16 acetyl because this had been shown to go up with age in in cells and culture and in yeast systems. And we asked if H4K16 acetyl changes in the human brain with age or with disease, and if so, how is it changing? And what we found is that if you just ask about the overall number of peaks during normal brain aging, as in model systems, the overall number of peaks increase from the younger cohort to the older co cohort. So that was really um, um, encouraging. But we also then found that H4K16 acetyl peaks are decreasing in Alzheimer's disease relative to old. And here's showing one of those um, genome browsers. This is the same I showed you before, showing that this peak at the promoter of this gene is upregulated in old, but not changed in the Alzheimer's situation or not maintained. So H4K16 acetyl is becoming redistributed with age, and it's becoming redistributed in the brain with age in a manner that is different from in Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, if we look at what's going on with peaks of H4K16 acetyl, we see that the peaks are predominantly gained with age, so a gain of 20,000 peaks, but H4K16 acetyl peaks are primarily lost in AD. So this dramatic loss of peaks is occurring in the Alzheimer's disease brain. And then we asked, what's the correlation between those H4K16 acetyl peak changes between aging and Alzheimer's disease? And we found that they are negatively correlated. So that is, where H4K16 acetyl is being gained with age, it is either failing to occur or failing to be maintained in Alzheimer's disease. To gain a greater insight into what was happening in this situation, we then did a three-way comparison of um, H4K16 acetyl changes in younger older and disease situation. So we split those into changes that were age regulated. So were small or big and young and when it went larger or small with old and did the same in Alzheimer's disease. Those that would be age dysregulated so large or small and young, but then small and large um, in disease, but were either didn't occur or um, failed to be maintained in Alzheimer's. And then those changes that were disease specific that are different and happening only in Alzheimer's disease, but are not happening normally in the brain with age. And when we did that, we found if we could look at just what's happening when we compare old to Alzheimer's, again, we find this really dominant loss of peaks, regions that are supposed to go up normally with age, but are becoming lost in the age um, in the Alzheimer's disease um, situation. So that suggests that um, to us that there might be something very special about these kinds of peaks that are happening in this situation. And we suggest that 
maybe those are gains that are normally established with age, and we would suggest they'd be protective, but are failing to occur or being maintained in the Alzheimer's disease brain. We then took our um, H4K16 acetyl peaks and integrated those data with the AD genome wide association study SNPs. And of course, those SNPs are mostly associated with gene regulatory regions um, and not the gene um, bodies. But these are marks, um, H4K16 acetyl, et cetera, that are associated with regulatory regions of genes. So we thought we might see some overlap um, that would let us know that some of the mechanisms that are impinging on um, these changes are due to changes in H4K16 acetyl. So when we did this, we found that indeed the ADGWAS SNPs can be, are significantly associated with H4K16 acetyl changes, but only for the age-regulated and disease-specific um, changes that we're seeing. But that helps us to pinpoint that these could be specific regulatory mechanisms, this type of a histone modification pathway that could be impinging on these genes. Um, and interestingly, the age dysregulated class of genes um, didn't show a significant association, suggesting that this may represent an additional regulatory mechanism that could be of value to explore to protect the aging brain from disease. So in these studies, um, we found that H4K16 acetyl is going up in the human brain with age, and we suggest that these gains may help protect um, against neurodegeneration in the cognitive normal brain. So while we were doing that, we were also taking a more unbiased approach to assess the epigenome. And in this way, we did a mass spec analysis of histone modifications on um, the chromatin from human brain tissue. So in this, we took brain tissue, extracted the histones, subject them to mass spec, and then did a relative quantification of the, dis of the different histone modifications. Um, and you can see that the total histone um, levels are not changing. And like we did detect some changes in various marks that are happening on the histone tails. But what was really striking to us in these data is that we saw a really dramatic enhancement um, enrichment in H3K27 acetyl that's occurring in Alzheimer's disease. So that seemed a really large increase. And so we went back then to our transcriptomic data and we asked if we could find any evidence of drivers of this situation. In our transcriptomic analysis, when we looked at upregulation um, genes, we found that indeed the top GO category is regulation of transcription. And when we look at those 75 um, genes, we find that among those are some key histone modifiers, CBP and P300 among them, with the, which um, do the H3K27 acetyl mark. And we in addition, probed two other data sets of RNA-seq that had temporal cortex um, transcriptomics, the Mayo Clinic and Mount Sinai, and they confirmed that there are statistically significant increases in CBP and P300 um, in age-matched versus Alzheimer's disease in their data. When we look at this um, genome-wide profile of what's going on with these peaks, Again, we see this preferential gain of new peaks in Alzheimer's disease. And if we compare these peaks that are happening in a situation with the young and the old, again, it's dominated by gains um, in H4 case 27 acetyl. Um, so these uh, disease specific gains are in a number of different pathways. Um, they include transcription, so indeed, CBP itself is subject <laughs> to gains, um, as well as other pathways involved in uh, nucleotide, uh, uh, nucleic acid metabolism, neuroplasticity, inflammation, other pathways that you would anticipate. And this is showing an, an example gene with an H3K27 gain. 
Once again, we asked about statistical overlap with AD genome-wide um, GWAS SNPs and found um, an st statistically significant overlap of H3K27 gains um, in the disease-specific situation. So these data suggested to us that H3K27 acetyl gains appear to be driving Alzheimer's associated neurodegeneration. So we wanted to see if we can then use some of our other systems like Drosophila to test this hypothesis. So to do that, we used um, flies expressing amyloid beta. So here's a wild type eye. If we express A beta 42, the eye um, is affected. And in this situation, rather than um, manipulate CBP itself, which has many deleterious effects. It's really important for development. Instead, what we did is we flooded the cells with histones um, to sort of push the cell either with wild type or with a histone um, mimetic that would mimic acetylation. And what we found is that whereas there's no effect if you just flood the cells with a wild type histone, if we flood them with um, a mimetic that is, uh, is upregulating H3K27 acetyl, we get an enhancement of the degeneration phenotype. So that suggests to us that indeed the fly is confirming the idea that increasing H3K27 acetyl is enhancing degeneration. So from this part of the talk, um, we suggest that what's hap what we're seeing here is that H3K27 acetyl gains are happening in the Alzheimer's situation, and they appear to be driving AD-associated neurodegeneration. And in fact, we suggest this could be a feed-forward loop, given that there's increased levels of these um, CBP and P300 in Alzheimer's disease. And moreover, CBP itself is subject to some of these acetylation changes. So in summary, I wanted to sort of emphasize the idea that we've studied two different types of histone acetylation modifications. And we suggest that they're driving different functional outcomes. So with H4K16 acetyl, um, our hypothesis is that what's happening normally with age is you're getting the activation of protective pathways that are occurring, and these are not occurring or not being maintained in Alzheimer's disease, but you're also getting the activation of pro-disease pathways. So, um, so then you're driving other um, situations. So this raises sort of the idea, does, you know, disease involve both inactivation of some pathways and activation of other pathways, sort of akin to the steps that are occurring in cancer of tumor suppressors versus oncogenes. And of course, what's exciting about epigenetics is that you epigenetics can be manipulated by small molecules. So these data on H4K16 acetyl suggests that um, types of gene activities that impinge on the enzymes that promote or prevent the deacetylation of H4K16 may promote healthy brain aging, whereas um, those that affect CBP inhibition may reduce H. 3K27 acetylation and impede neurodegeneration. And I think this also scores another issue um, because we're, I think we're all aware that a lot of HDAC inhibitors are being attempted, you know, try, being used as, um, as ways to mitigate neurodegeneration. But those HDAC inhibitors um, tend to be characterized by a lack of specificity. And so you can see here, if you get you know, a more general type of molecule, you may not see an effect because you're too widely attacking. And maybe we have to be more focused um, in order to see effects. So I did wanna end by talking about our current directions. 
So in the course of our studies, one of the things we found is if we compare our gold standard, our human brain data to the other data sets that existed out there on mouse, we actually found that those particular mouse models were very poor um, modelers of the human situation. So um, one of the things we've really been focused on is generating IPS um, derived cortical neurons and other models, as well as testing other mouse models, for example, spreading models, et cetera, so that we can compare the epigenetic status of the gold standard human brain um, in order to establish systems where we can now go in and manipulate those marks. And um, although we're still in the process of testing those data, we've been really excited by the fact that it looks like the models that we're testing do appear to show transcriptomic changes that are reflecting our human brain data. So we think we're going to get good models in hand. Um, I'm always going to be focusing on aspects of the fly, so we'll continue to expand our fly studies, doing both epigenomic approaches as well as genome-wide screens of chromatin players for impact on disease phenotypes. I mean, we're hoping to get a situation where we can couple together the fly and some of these high, more highly manipulable models in order to do screens for various compounds that might be effective. And in the human brain, um, we're expanding our approach in a number of different ways. One is we're going after silencing marks now. We're just in the beginning of this analysis, and it does look like there's um, some unexpected um, things going on with silencing. We're going after cell populations, so neurons versus glia, and we're also engaged in analyzing the 3D genomic architecture because some of our transcriptomics and um, looking at motifs affected implicates architectural proteins being affected in that. And with these experimental and computational pipelines established, we can now use our really high quality FTD tissue um, and ask the extent to which this second situation of neurodegenerative disease might be similar um, or different to Alzheimer's disease. And just to end, um, I'd like to thank the people involved in with this. In my lab, it's a Oksana Sherbakova and Nance Srinivasan. And in our collaboration with Shelley Berger, um, most of that published work was done by Rafaela Nativio, who's at Imperial College London. And we have two fantastic computational scientists, Greg Donahue and Yamin. And um, I'm grateful to our collaborators. And mostly we thank the patients and their families who very generously share tissue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. That is really breathtaking in terms of not only the work you've done, but in terms of the pathway forward that that suggests Thank the rethinking you. aspects of both ALS and FTD. Thank you so much for that. There are several questions. We have a couple of minutes uh, before we yes. get go, go, Should yeah. I stop sharing here? Yeah, we There you go. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Finn Gao asks, uh, can you reveal cell type specific changes in addition to disease specific changes? Yes. So the types of approaches that we're attacking now are in the human tissue, we're going to do bulk, bulk cell type um, sequencing analysis. But in the mouse models, and indeed we found good mouse models, um, we can do um, not only bulk, but now single cell to ask what's going on. So um, to us, it's really important to get those really good models that we think are reflecting our gold standard human in order to really understand those changes that are happening. And you've mentioned increasingly the use of iPSC derived cortical neurons, for example. One of the challenges is deciding what it means to be studying, say, a 30 day old neuron in culture versus what you see in a 30 or 60 year old brain. Can you comment? I mean, the one word yes. is a great discrepancy there. Yes. So that, of course, as you're pointing out, was one of our major um, concerns about this. So can we really 
use cells and culture like that and IPS cells and culture and think we're going to learn something about a process that takes decades in humans. And so what I'm really excited to say is that because we can use the human changes and see if we're seeing those changes yeah. in the IPS yeah. cells, we're in fact validating it. And I'm super excited about that point of view. Um, okay. And so, um, so I think the answer is, um, yes, and I'm very excited about that because, as you know, there's a lot of wealth in the field with all these different kind of iPS cells modeling different types of genetic ALS and et cetera. And I think they're going to be incredibly useful. And I'm not sure I would have thought that before we started our studies, right? So we've been able to test that. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple of questions that overlap a little bit concerning the brain regions you're looking at. The question was asked, what regions do you study of young, old, or AD brains? And then how do you predict or normalize for the different distributions in different regions of cell types? So this is getting back a little bit toward yeah. Professor Gao's question, especially with regard to neurodegeneration in yeah. AD. Yep. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. We selected the temporal cortex for our studies um, because um, we thought the hippocampus is going to be too blown out, but we wanted to get, we didn't want to go into frontal cortex. We thought that oh, would be helpful for us. And it's, it's been nice because we can actually compare our data to other data in other regions and sort of see a progression of gene changes that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, we know in our situation, one reason for working with John Trojanowski and the CNDR is they've done really careful analysis of the patient tissue. So we kind of know the distribution and we've examined the distribution of glia versus neurons. Um, and in our samples, there's no neural degeneration is not impacting that. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, we are definitely working towards trying to figure out how to take frozen human brain tissue and separate into neuron, neural and glial fractions so that we can then sequence those and do some types of chromatin approaches that we could do in smaller numbers like that and ask about those effects in neurons versus glia. That's fantastic. Uh, one last question. Is increasing H3K27 acetylated in a wild type fly background, not a mutant, uh, A beta, sufficient to drive eye degeneration? And, and, and do you expect to see the H3K27 acetylated marks in other settings, such as FTD or PD? You've touched on that, but maybe you can elaborate, please. Right. That's a great question. So and with the current transgenes that we have, we did not see any change when we flooded the cell with histones that would drive H3K27 acetyl, at least um, in a young fly. So um, we haven't actually looked over age to ask if, you know, when the animal gets 60 days old, which would be like, um, a 60 year old human if we would see anything. So that's a really um, good idea. And the other thing that we're doing, we have a number of these different um, histone types modification genes that we're testing in other situations such as C9 ORF72 um, and TDP43 to see if we can identify other situations that are driving disease in that. Excellent, thank you. And actually another question has come in which might be phrased slightly differently. And that is, you've made the point elegantly that if there is dysfunction in the histone marks, there can be cognitive decline. Can you turn it around and ask this question? Does the status of cognition affect the distribution of marks? Yeah. So, you know, in our tissue, um, we, for example, in our mass spec, we can see some changes between normal aging and controls, but um, it was much more dramatic actually looking at Alzheimer's versus controls. And I think it could be because the rate of aging in people is going to probably be more sporadic. So we didn't select people based on their, you know, obviously they were all cognitively, you know, normal, but, um, 
but it's certainly um, that's a really interesting question and we're really we are also studying other genes that are absolutely critical for um, normal gene expression that's going to happen with aging. And again, in that, we're incorporating both young and old in order to ask if the whole status is changed in that. So it's a really interesting question. Right now, we don't have um, an answer to that. Thank you. Well, again, <clears throat> thank you for a really spectacular talk and our thanks as well to Amar. I think now, <clears throat> unless